Hi there, and welcome to Art for All, the Sketchbook School podcast. I'm Danny Gregory, and I'm joined by Jill Bodonsky. Hi, Jill. Hi, Danny. It's nice to have you here on another scintillating episode of the podcast, where we delve into the issues that are, I don't know, an essential part of being a creative person, the things that, that trouble us, the opportunities for growth, the challenges we have, um, the things that nobody ever really told you how to fix, maybe when you were in art school or high school or at any other point, um, how do you fix this stuff? So that's what we're here to talk about. Um, I am a, a writer and, uh, I don't know, I'm a writer and the founder of Sketchbook School. Jill, what are your qualifications for talking about style besides your hair? I am also a writer. I've written three books and I teach creativity coaching. I teach people how to be creativity coaches and I've done a lot of art. So uh, I'm fascinated by the topic of style. Yeah, so that's our topic for today. Style, where does it come from? How do we get it? Um, uh, what's it good for? What is it? Why is it? All those kinds of things. So that'll be our topic. And um, But we're going to start with a little bit of fun. We're going to start with a creative calisthenic. So let's begin there. With so we call this part of the show Creative Calisthenics because Jill provides us with a little thing to think about. Jill, can you explain what creative calisthenics are? Creative calisthenics are just little odd questions that should get you out of the usual questions of life. So you can exercise your, your creativity, your imagination, your skills of association a little bit, which can spill over to other areas of your life, such as art and writing. Right. So it's kind of like... Uh... It's a warm-up exercise. It is uh, something, it's like chewing gum for your brain, I guess, to just kind of work your muscles. And it's, I think it's, it's, an, it's a great thing to do to just think of stuff, right? To think of ideas, because like any kind of exercise, if you think of stuff on a regular basis, then when you need to think of stuff, you've kind of got a system, you've got a process, you've got the muscles kind of worked out to do that. Yeah, you actually create this this other cognitive pathway when you answer questions like this. So your fluidity of thought and thinking begins to chirp up a little bit, which is a real important part of creativity. Right, absolutely. So use it or lose it. So, yeah. so all right, so um, Jill, tell us about this week's Creative Calisthenic. Well, since today's topic is on style, this is your calisthenic and think about in three words describe the style of your hair so what is your hairstyle in just three words only three words so there you go that's a challenging one for me um all right so i have to think of it on the spot um three words to describe my hairstyle um and by the way, I, I put these on my Facebook page and have writers and comedians answer them, and they don't answer them right away. They think about them. So Danny is really on the spot with this. I am, uh, yeah, I'm, I don't have the patience to spend a lot of time thinking about anything, so I, I have to be reactive, I guess. Um, um, what would I say? I would say f um, freshly mown lawn. See, it works for you not to have a lot of time. <laughs> so, yeah. So what is your answer? What is yours? Please put it in with into the chat. If you're here watching us live to say put in CC and uh, we will stop a little bit later and have a look. So don't you don't have to do it immediately. We will come back and uh, we will discuss them. So what about you, Jill? Let's put you on the spot. What's yours? Oh, yeah, I should have thought I went. Uh -oh. How about only my hair oh, that's three that's four naturally curly hair naturally curly hair okay naturally curly hair. that's fine that, that describes you so in a lineup we would know you based on that yeah fair yeah. enough very good um we actually have some funny ones popping up so maybe we should grab a couple right now so uh 
artsy fartsy chick says bedhead wild. Yeah. That that certainly <laughs> is evocative. Uh, Janine says messy bun. Well, you have one more word, Janine. So think about yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Robin says long, flimsy, uncombed. This is a disheveled group that are our, our listeners. <laughs> Artists uh, are disheveled. Robert Crumb says, need a hat. Yeah, I know that feeling. Uh, Dark Jet Black says, secret forest. Good. A little redundant, but yes. And uh, Sandra says, very, very short. And Scott says, not bald. Yeah. Now, I resent that. <laughs> Nothing wrong with it. <laughs> so yeah, so we'll come back to some of these. They're fun. And uh, remember, please put CC in front of it so we can find them. Uh, a lot of you are not doing that because artists have such difficulty following rules, rules, right? Yeah. I know. So please try and follow the rules, guys. All right. Um, let us, let's move on to talking about the block of the week. So... So the block of the week is a special topic that we pick for each week, and we talk about uh, what it is, why it is, how it affects you, and what you can do about it. So today's topic is style. How do you develop a style? What is a style? What would you say a style is, Jill, in your estimation? What is a style, creative style? I think a style is exciting. (laughs) <laughs> that's, that's my first word. But I, I think it's the characteristics of your artwork. It's something that can constantly be transforming or something that for a lot of my students is, is there from the start. But it's, it's, it's what distinguishes your work from others. Yeah, so it's kind of, yeah I, think, I think it's true. I think it's kind of like you are able to recognize your child in a crowd, right? So it's like, what is... What is it that makes it yours and that you say, okay, yeah, that's pretty much me. That's, that's, uh, that's my style. Um, and I think a lot of times you can, you can cultivate a style also, right? So you can, you can have a natural style. Like a good example of that is your signature. So your signature is, you know, the words that make up your name. But of course, the way that you sign them often feels like you. So if you've ever like gotten a celebrity's autograph, you know, Ideally, you want it to feel like them. You know, is it big and bold? Is it funny? Is it, you know, loose? What, what is the style of it, the actual thing that's applied to the letters? So, so I think that that's, you know, it's, it's something additional beyond just, like if you to do, did a portrait, the style is what makes it distinctive to you. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. Great, great example with the, the signature, too, because over time we... We perfect our, our signature to more reflect who we are. I think the same thing happens with our, our art. And I think that's why it's exciting. You're, you have this tangible evidence of who you are staring back at you. And that can give us confidence to take risks and, and the courage to, to go beyond our comfort zone, which I think is important when you're developing a style. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot, a lot of people say to me, um, how do I get a style? Right, so that suggests that there's something else going on besides just the natural way that you do things. And if you think about something, if you think about a, a famous artist, if you think about Van Gogh, you think about Andy Warhol, um, you think about Jean-Michel Basquiat, they have a style, right? So you could copy their style. So theoretically, you could do a piece of art that looked like it was from them, even though, of course, it wasn't. So, you know, th- there comes a point where you say, well, how do I have a style? And, and if, if, for instance, you want to be an illustrator, having a style might be very essential to your success in your career because an illustrator that doesn't have a style, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't know how to hire a person like that. You want to know kind of like what are you going to get? And it's, I think it's sort of like, you know, going to a restaurant. You want to know like what kind of food are you going to get there? So I think in some ways you need to make some decisions in order to have a style. Right, it isn't just natural. You think that's true? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think a really good way to make decisions is to look at other people's work and maybe even write down what it is you like about that. 
Um, I think I think that's one of the ways. I, the first time I saw Saul Steinberg's work, I remember vividly that I didn't know art could be like this. And if you don't know who he is, it's these really loose one, sometimes one line drawings that are mostly humorous. And I remember picking up this book in the bookstore in college and it was $12 and thinking, I'm going to have to miss some lunches <laughs> and buy this book because I was so in love with his style. So yeah. go into Pinterest and looking around and writing, what do I like about this? I think um, it's a good yeah. way to start. Yeah. I mean, uh, Sandra says, I made my signature very clear. Am I in trouble with a style? And I would say, well, even that is your style in a way, right? I mean, I think when you make a signature, the reason to have a signature is so that nobody else can copy it, right? That nobody else, only you could have done it. And it doesn't matter whether it's clear or messy or in, illegible. What matters is it is distinctively yours. And I think the same is true when it comes to your creative style. And it's not necessarily that you have to make something that, you know, you can copyright. That's not the point of it. It's really more that you are making something that expresses yourself. And I think that's something I, I'd like to kind of delve into is... Ultimately, I think your style comes from who you are. And that could mean a bunch of different things. It could mean your temperament. Um, and it could also mean your history. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, it reminds me of how I started this whole work was in a psychiatric hospital, not as a patient, but as a um, occupational therapist. And one of the things I did with the psychiatrist was administer a battery of drawings and the patients would do things like draw their body, draw their family um, at the dinner table. And they didn't know it, but they were projecting their needs and their conflicts. So it would take it to the psychiatrist and he would go, oh, look at the relationship between mom and dad here. Um, so they were projecting who they were into the drawings without even knowing it. And I don't know if you've ever done one of those drink and draw or drink and paint things. I always drink. I there. always drink when I draw. Yeah. Oh, oh, is that the explanation? Um, <laughs> but I've done one and everybody's doing the same thing. You know, the instructor's going, okay, this is how you do the lamppost. But everybody's painting is different because everybody already has a style, even when they're copying somebody just step by step. So I think, I think that's a comforting thing to know as you're going into it. You don't have, there's no real right or wrong. So you're not in trouble. Um, with your signature you're you know putting that kind of stuff is what restricts us just kind of letting go and celebrating your signature i think that's true i think um it's interesting in, in a case of a drink and draw because so often that is people who are not um used to expressing themselves in drawing so uh you would think in a way that they wouldn't necessarily have a style emerging yet. And, and I think in, in general, people who are first starting to draw tend to have the, the, let's say the lack of experience is a large component of their style, right? So mm -hmm. they're tending to draw in a way that suggests they're not really comfortable or they're not really looking clearly. And I think, again, the, the quality of your line, it's like a, like a, seismograph or um, even like a um, cardiogram it is reflecting your inner state right so you're so a lot of times the dominant inner state of a beginner is fear and anxiety and judgment and so your line often is shaggy or rough and so forth because you're not confident in what you're doing so you're stammering you're whispering you're you know, you're speaking in, in a particular way. Um, but as you get more kind of comfortable, you start to become more yourself, right? Mm -hmm. Over time. Yeah, good point. I, I think when I focus a lot on people developing their voices in my classes, and one exercise I think helps people with that is making them close their eyes and draw. Because you know, people are still in fear. Some people are even in more fear when they do that, even though you've taken all risk of being perfect away. I say risk of being perfect, but you can't be perfect when you have your, your eyes closed. And 
oftentimes they really like what came out, but it's always different. It's different. Your voice is already coming out when you're doing something with your eyes closed. Um, so it's a good way to get through that fear, I think. So it, you, th it's kind of weird because you would think that if your eyes are closed, you're afraid also. <laughs> you're afraid of, you know, making, drawing off the paper or, you know, you're thinking all along, this is going to be a total mess because I can't even see what I'm doing. And yet somehow you're still filtering who you are. Right. And I, I think it's important to have permission to go off the page and go, this is going to look nothing like you think it's going to look. But that's where I know a lot of my style came from making mistakes or accidents. Where I went, oh, I didn't mean to do that. Oh, I actually like that. Mm. So I'm going to start doing that more. Uh, yeah, I, th I think it's... Um, there are other things, other ways we express ourselves that might have style too. Like for instance, just your voice when you speak. Um, usually when we know people, you can just pick up the phone and immediately be able to tell who it is, right? Um, and, and a lot of that's not particular. Most people don't kind of decide to have a, cer a certain voice. But because we use our voices a lot, our voices become extensions of who we are. Uh, the way that we speak is a reflection of so many things. It may be a reflection of our age. It may be a reflection of our physical, like the structure of our throat or something. But it's also a reflection of all of the experiences that we've had, where we come from, who we grew up with, what kinds of words we use. All those sorts of things are, again, you know, fairly specific to who we are. And that can be true in... in other forms of creativity as well. Yeah, I never thought of that about the voice, but that's <clears throat> that's the word we use too when we're talking about art is our our voice, and I, I think it's exciting finding what that is. And I I think sometimes, like you said, people have a hard time at the beginning because they're trying to be like everyone else. They're thinking that's the right way to be is like everyone else, and I, I think. One of your other podcasts, I had a story about how I didn't like my art, but I had a friend who who hung it in a, a cafe, even though I didn't know it was being hung in the cafe. And I thought it was all these mistakes and it was unfinished and somebody bought it for three hundred and fifty dollars. So I was like, what? What did they like about this? And I realized I liked it, too. I just didn't think it was the right way you were supposed to do things, this unfinished, loose look then became more of my style with that. So. so do you think that, I mean, we're acting, we're, the way that we're discussing it, it seems like um, your style is like your face, your features. It's just something you were kind of born to. And like, yes, you could go off and get plastic surgery or something like that. But generally, we, all, we look like how we look. Do you think that that is true of our art? Or do you think we have some say in the matter? Can we adjust our style? I think our style can be adjusted. I think it transforms. I know mine has. Mine started out, it's really still very whimsical, but I've gotten more loose with it. And I, I look at other artists like, you know, Picasso and see how his style has changed. George O'Keefe, her style has changed. I think the more we learn about ourselves, the more our style can change because it's information. It's information about who we are. Um, and yeah. I, I look back on stuff I've done a long time ago and it's not me anymore. So how about you? you? Yeah, I mean, I, I contain multitudes, as Walt Whitman said. I think there are lots of different things, inclinations that I have. There are times that, um, I mean, to me, a lot of my drawing is is a motive it's you know it's based in how i'm feeling at a given time so there are times when i feel um bold i want to draw with a brush yeah uh, um, there are times that i feel sort of precise and i'll draw with a very very fine pen and i'll do a lot of cross hatching and i'll you know draw slowly um, there are times where i want to use a lot of color you know i think about there are times in my life, I mean, here's an example, is when my first wife passed away, before she died, I had been drawing in just in black and white. I had gone for a period of, of um, a month or so where I had just been drawing with a black pen, no real shading, no color. It was just the phase that I was going through is how I was feeling. 
after she passed away, a week or so later when I started to draw again, I had this strong desire to draw in bright, bright colors. She loved color, mm-hmm. and maybe that's what was influencing me. But I felt like I... And if you had asked me, after a loss, would you want to use bright colors? You'd think, no, I'd want to be somber and so forth. But I didn't. I, my art wanted to be... When my art wanted to make me feel better, I think, is what was going on. And so I used the brightest colors I'd ever used before. And I used um, P, Dr. P.H. Martin's um, liquid watercolors that are really, really intense, almost fluorescent colors. And that's what I was painting. And for the next year or so, I drew in these really bright colors. And, you know, but then there'll be other periods, periods where and I definitely tend to seesaw between this sort of tightness and looseness, you know, um, and uh, yeah. So I, I feel like in some, sometimes it's a reflection of me and my personality and my feelings and my emotions. And sometimes it's also like a my my artist personality maybe has ups and downs too that are slightly different. So that's why, you know, I I will go through these phases. Yeah, I think there it's okay to have a whole bunch of different styles. I was hanging a show a couple of months ago and was talking to my boyfriend saying everything in this show is different it just there's no particular style here mm-hmm. and he was saying anybody would recognize that this is your stuff it's it's got similar colors in it there's there's usually some humor in it um so sometimes we we feel like that but and your your point about art being kind of the medicine to feel better i think was a huge part of me getting through the pandemic. I think I, I took a huge leap in using art to escape what was happening there and and um, made a lot of progress during that time because it made me feel better. Yeah, I so. look at my, at my pandemic sketchbook and it was again, black and white. So in this case, I was just, I was afraid. I didn't want to go, f- I didn't want to take risks. I felt locked down as we were and then at a certain point, I was like, screw this. I want to I want to have fun. I want to make myself better. I feel better. And I want to just start using color. And I want to experiment. And I want to try new things. And I'm, I'm ready to grow. I'm ready to change. So I think these things happen. And yet, again, like you, they were all recognizably me. I would have no doubt that it was mine. But um, it was different aspects of me. Because I think, again, that's another thing. Like, going back to your voice, you're not in a monotone all the time. You... You use your voice to express different aspects of yourself. So it can be true here too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah. Um, so do you think um, you were not that good of a judge of your style? That's why your boyfriend had to point this out to you? Yes. Yeah, I just, I mean, I actually, I think this is important for people to hear. I actually liked what I was doing, but I really, I was comparing myself with other people and thinking this is not the type of work that you you frame and and hang up someplace but evidently it was and that was hugely freeing to me i just went that just became a huge turning point for for me to to do loose things and i think and i see that in workshops i like somebody's work and they're like oh that's not very good um, which is annoying because <laughs> it's like wait that's my opinion um but I don't think they're their own audience sometimes. So I think it's important for, for people to, to look through a different lens and, and begin maybe to appreciate it a little bit more, um, if other people are too. See what they are seeing and see if you can enjoy it as well. Yeah, I mean, I say to people like that, I say, you're a good artist, you're not a good judge. So that's fine. You know, you're not able to see your own stuff clearly. And I think also what you're saying about framing, is this, is this frame worthy? It's amazing how you can take a piece of art and put it into a frame and it changes, right? When you take it mm-hmm. and you put a mat on it, you put it in a frame, you put it behind glass, you hang it on the wall, it becomes another thing, you know? And so that's a way of sort of um, respecting your art is by giving it that kind of a treatment and saying, uh, you know, let's see what you look like in, a, in, good, in your good clothes, you know, that might be worth trying. I walk around my my workshops with a mat and and I'll put it over people's drawings and I keep one for myself too. And they're shocked. They're shocked at how good it looks when it has a mat around it. So that's a good thing to keep by your side when you're doing your work. 
Absolutely. And taking a picture of it helps too, just because you have the frame in your little smart camera and it immediately looks better than you think it does. Right. So when it comes to cultivating a style, you know, I think about, there's certainly artists who I really like. They're not artists who I copy necessarily, but they're certainly artists who I look at and I say, that person is saying something that I want to say. They're saying something in a way that I would like to, like they've, they've captured, their worldview is like my worldview, but they're better at it or they're clearer in it. They're more, they're sharper with it. And, and a lot of times that is the process that you go through is you refine your point of view. So again, like if you think about your signature, you know, I think we all went through this phase when we were like eight or nine years old where you're practicing your signature and then eventually you like kind of get it down. And what you're doing when you do that is also you're training your body to do your signature perfectly every time, right? So after a while, you don't even need to think about it. You can sign lots of documents and it'll all look the same. And I think similarly mm -hmm. with our personal style, we can get to that point by refining it. But I think when you look at someone, um, like I, th I think about people who I have always loved, Ronald Searle, um, Sol Steinberg, uh, Robert Crumb. Um, there's just a lot of artists who I look at, I say, yeah, you're telling this kind of stories I want to tell. Um, so, you know, I've sat down and copied them, sit down, take a drawing and copy it. And when you really take your time and copy line by line somebody else's drawing, there comes a point where you become them, you know, mm -hmm. and you start to see like, this is what it was like for this person to make this drawing. You know, you're, you're not exactly like them because they're looking at something and, and making a drawing based on that. But you're getting to see how they saw and what did they think was important and where were their emphases. And you start to internalize that way of looking so that when you make your own work, again, you're not necessarily doing it in their way, but you're refining that process so that you're becoming truer to you just as you were truer to them when you did it. Have you, have, do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I love that. I love how you put that. And I, I think for some people, I you know work with some people and they have great work and I go, I compliment them. They go, well, I was just copying somebody else. And I, I think it's really important. And then I'll ask them, can I see what you were copying? And it doesn't look that much like what they were copying. You're still projecting your own self into it. But that's where the master started. That's where you start when you're writing too, you get somebody else's voice in your head. And then you begin to make modifications of your own. When, when I'm looking at other people's work, it's more visceral. I, I, I feel myself gasp when, um, when I see something I really love that I hadn't seen before. And then I, I try to attempt to, to do what they're doing in, every time I go off in my own direction. So I think when people are stuck, it's a good place to start by using someone else as a kind of a scaffolding for your beginning. Yeah, I mean, I think you could think of it like a jazz musician. Most jazz starts with standards, right? So you take, you take a song that everybody plays and you play it and you're not going to play it exactly like Oscar Peterson or Miles Davis. You're going to play it. You can't help but play it in your way. But you have a framework, you know, you have something to respond to when you're doing it. So, you know, that's, that is a process that you can kind of put yourself through, which we don't think of as being part of drawing, you know, the way we think of it is in music. But I think another, another example of, with writing, I think this is something we all probably did in high school, write a paragraph like Ernest Hemingway you know, um, or pick some other author that you really like, and how would you write a paragraph like them? So when you're doing that, you're thinking, well, what is it that makes them them? And if that's the case, what makes me me? You know, mm -hmm. can I do the same kind of analysis on me? Mm -hmm. I love that. I, uh, I, I did this little exercise, I think it's, it's kind of fun to do. And that's looking, I looked at a Picasso and a Matisse and I looked at their colors and their style, and then I chose my own subject and did did two cats in the form of Picasso. And I, I did my own looking out the window in the form of Matisse, but using their colors and 
and their style. And it was, it was a real nice way of being me, but also experiencing their influence on that and um, helped me discover. I, and I, I, I didn't like it as much as I like what I do now, but it got me out of my, my typical default thing, which I think it's really important to develop your style is, is try something new um, and work at it. And I, again, a lot of perfectionists think it needs to be there immediately. I don't have it. It, it just comes with a, I mean, I, I, again, look at my other sketchbooks, things I thought was good. <laughs> it's like, wow, I've come a long ways because I've been doing it a lot. Right. So, yeah. What's, what you're seeing also is interesting in terms of um, isolating what makes you, you is if you think of copying somebody, it's almost like like a Venn diagram. So you have like, on one hand, you have the thing that the Matisse made, and then you have the thing that you made that is in response to them. And the differences between them in a way, a way of isolating what makes you different from Matisse. And so you mm -hmm. can sort of then almost like get rid of Matisse and look at what were the elements that were you, that were particularly you. So I think it's it's partly... Are you willing to sit down, not to judge what you did, but to analyze it and to say, like, it's interesting, like, I like using these tools or I like using making lines that are like this or my lines tend to be long and flowing and I tend to, you know, prefer these sorts of colors. It just helps you to understand yourself better. And I think it's sort of like when we're teenagers, you know, teenagers are very style aware, right? And part of that is because they're looking for themselves. So you try on mm. guises that other people have. So you wear clothes, you do your hair a certain way, you know, you listen to a certain kind of music. You're trying on different um, costumes in a way. And then eventually you get to a point where you go, you know what, I've tried these different things and this is the stuff that defines me. And so we can do the same thing with art where we just say, you know, let me try doing, let me pick a bunch of artists I like and do it. It can also be an interesting way to look at artists you don't like and say, what exactly is it about them that doesn't speak to me? And again, that can help you. These are all ways of understanding yourself. So part of it's about making art, but part of it's about, you know, just getting more clarity and, and self-awareness, I think, which is a really important part of being an artist is knowing yourself. Yeah, right? it's your relationship with yourself. Your art is your relation. And that's why I find it so exciting because it's how am I going to interpret this and how, and making sure I'm excited about it. You know, if, if you're not excited about talking about your work, then you may need to go back to redefining it or experimenting a different way. Because um, for me, it's exciting to see what I'm going to come up with next. Um, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To, to, and, and to see, a lot of times making art can show you something about yourself too, where you say, absolutely, oh, this, look what's going on with me, like I'm doing this thing, um, you know, that, and, and particularly when you keep a sketchbook and you have um, a chronological kind of um, understanding, like, like I do a lot of self-portraits and they're all different, they all sort of look like me, but they're, they're all really different yeah. one from the other. And, you know, I look back at them and I go, oh, I've made myself green. Oh, you know, I made myself really sc scrawny. I made myself, you know, um, very s sort of simple and un no, not a lot of details. You can look at that and just think like, hmm, I wonder why that's how I saw me. What does that say? Mm -hmm. so, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, um, all right, well, good. I think this has been a, a fun conversation. I think we're going to go on and we're going to move on to the next section, which is um, talking about or reading. We're both going to read from uh, various books that we've written. Uh, to remind you all, if you would like to submit a question to us, please put a Q and then the question. Otherwise, we will never find it in the chat. And if you want to share your creative calisthenic answer, put a CC. Um, but yes, meanwhile, let's go on to book break. Uh, and we're back. Um, so, uh, Jill, do you want to go ahead, go first and read something from one of your books? Okay, this is from a book I'm currently writing, and it's, it's called I Make Art So I Don't Die of Reality. And just some background, because I'm not going to read this whole bit. 
uh, I used to accompany my mom on art outings to Coconut Grove in Miami, which is a real tropical place right on the water. And she had her oil paints and I had my crayons, which would melt in the Miami sun, which was horrifying at first until I realized I could color with three different colors at the same time. She painted like a professional. She'd been a draftsman for the aeronautics industry. So you could see this perfectionistic skill in her paintings. Um, and I didn't, and she would do these these uh, ocean waves that were so realistic, they looked like they could splash right out of the painting. And we were trying to do sailboats. So mom would take a crayon and go over my drawings to make them look more accurate. With straight professional lines drawn over imperfect sailboats, they look like wobbly boats with corrective scaffolding or like they were in jail. I inherited my mom's perfectionism, but having ADHD made drawing with precision a lot like driving a car with no steering wheel. My drawings swerve a lot. They look like they've driven over a couple of speed bumps and sometimes crashed before they were finished. This worked for the style that was eventually developing. I was still in love with what I was doing, not because I could bring doodles in existence for the amusement of my friends, but because I had a place to escape to. I stayed with my version of uneven and imperfect squiggles, and they evolved into a style of imprecise whimsy purposeful flaws, incomplete completeness, which I very much relate to. I like this look of not being perfect. I connected to it much more. My style is fleeting, freeing, mysterious, and for the most part has a more of a story than anything drawn perfect. It was a fixation with playfulness, open defiance of inflexibility and liberating experimentation. My untidy style entered me into the world of wabi-sabi. And wabi-sabi, according to Tom Robbins, is the aesthetic of finding beauty in the imperfect and the unexpected, the secret private joy of being attuned to the Zen of things. So that's a little story the, about how my style developed. <laughs> that's some very nice writing as well. So it sounds like that those drawings kind of seemed to be the style of your mother and your relationship too, in a way, like looking at that drawing with her kind of bringing order on, t on top of your energy yeah. uh, seems like. Oh, it was so indicative of our, our relationship. Let me control this for you. And, it, and I think my style was very defiant. It's like, you be perfect, I'm going to be just the opposite. Um, and then I just started to like that part of things. I noticed this comment while you were reading, uh, Persona says, is it possible to get anywhere with art when you have ADHD and keep jumping from one thing to another? Yes. <laughs> have a bunch of different things going on at the same time. Um, I think ADHD, a lot of people don't realize how it serves us. If you, if you do research on ADHD, uh, most people with ADHD are creative. They are able to hold more ideas in their head. And when you do that, you associate and connect more. Um, so don't let ADHD, I, my attention span is, is really, and that's why I do really quick things um, and don't spend a lot of time. Watercolor and sketching are perfect for me. Oil painting, not so much, sometimes acrylics, but just have a bunch of things going at the same time. Capitalize on it. <laughs> keep a bunch of, yeah, keep a bunch of uh, pots going on the uh, on the stove. There's nothing wrong with that necessarily. If that's yeah. your style. I mean, ADHD is a style in a way, or an, or something that influences your style, right? Yeah, embrace it. Embrace yeah. it. Yeah. Um, Paula asks again, what's the name of the book? You mentioned it uh, at the beginning because you're still writing it. Yeah, I'm still writing it. It's called "I Make Art So I Don't Die of Reality." So. Be looking for that. Nothing like having die in your title. That's good. I mean, yeah. it sounds like <laughs> mystery fans and stuff like that. Good. All right. Um, shall I read something then? Yeah. Please do. Okay. So I'm going to read from this book, which is called The Creative License, Giving Yourself Permission to Be the Artist You Truly Are. And um, this is, a, I'm just going to read a part of this thing that I wrote called I Contain Multitudes, because I was thinking about if you want to, if, if we're saying that style is an expression of who you are, what if you're lots of things, then what? Um, 
Last night I was thinking about how hard it is to stay in my own skin. Maybe that's the way art is supposed to make you feel, to catapult you into another aspect of yourself and let you dwell there for a while. Or maybe that's just what it is to be human and to try to live an examined life. I'm reacting intensely to all of the things I'm going through right now, all the different audiences I seem to be strutting past. I want to be me, to express that meanness, and yet it's so varied, so contradictory. There's me as a husband, a father, a son, a brother, an illustrator, an author, a blogger, a copywriter, a professional, and a novice, a teacher, a student, a know-it-all, and an idiot, uh, ad guy, art guy, ugly American guy, and registered alien Jew, Christian, Buddhist, and atheist, hermit, tireless self-promoter, success, and failure. It's not really that I'm seeking the answer anymore. My adolescence is so far behind me, and I've worn out my allotment of midlife crises. It's more that I'm perpetually restless, only temporarily satisfied with any conclusion. Perhaps this is the biological imperative that moves successful organisms toward adaptation and evolution. Those who are content to keep chowing down on a certain kind of leaf or to hang out by a certain waterhole are secure until the crap comes down. Then it's only those shifty, scuttling rodents in the undergrowth that make it to the next level. We are the descendants of every successful shapeshifter that's been till now, the freakiest of all mutated freaks. And these days, as the brown comes down more heavily than ever, only the unsatisfiable will survive. So perhaps I'm working my way up to missing Linkhood, or maybe I'll just be the first lemming off the cliff, or worst yet, somewhere lost in the middle of the herd. Um, so wow, <laughs> that that is deep and vulnerable, and um, I'm gonna buy that book just to reread that. It's good <laughs> stuff. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's something I think about a lot, which is. Um, you know, how do you, if you, you know, again, going back to Whitman, if you are all these different things, how do you get that on paper? Um, mm -hmm. what, how do you speak in one voice if you feel like a chorus? Um, how do you remain clear and present yourself if you're shifting from one attitude to, one, to another? I mean, I'm really old now, and yet I still find that every day I have you know, a different interest, a different, and I, and I, I don't think I have ADHD. I think I'm just interested in a lot of stuff. Um, You're and curious. I, and I, yeah. And I move around a lot. So, you know, and I'll, I'll certainly put on one suit one day and put on a different suit another day. Um, but I feel like in the end, my art is still recognizable, just like I'm recognizable, no matter what I'm wearing, people don't doubt that it's me. And I think that that's, you know, this, this business of style of, identity they're all kind of intertwined and i think it's not a it's not a simple thing that's why there are 10 billion of us and there are 10 billion styles um and you know we all are need to embrace that that thing of us while not feeling bad that it may not be consistent um I think if you're a professional illustrator you need to have a consistent style so that somebody knows what they're buying from you but other, if you're just an artist expressing yourself, express the many yous. That's perfectly acceptable as part of the process. And don't try to think about it so much. I think, you know, one of the instructions I give to people is stop thinking and, and just start allowing your intuition and your instinct to take over because everything, we can't, we can't put everything we, we are into one simple painting, but the more we're doing, the more comes out in it. So I, I think um, just staying with it, not trying to analyze it too much until afterwards, you know, like Danny was saying about the, the sailboat with the lines over, you can see that afterwards, but during it, it's just allowing whatever wants to come out to come out and knowing that you will be reflecting yourself and having a lot of interests like, like Danny does, I think really serves our, our artwork because that comes out in the artwork as well. Yeah, I think I think we shouldn't feel bad about it. I, I have a lot of people say to me, well, I'm a jack of all trades, you know, and so I'm always interested in lots of things and I'm always going after the next shiny object. Um, I, I think when you fall in love, you will know it, you know, but that doesn't mean that you can't date a lot in, until you do. So I think you can, mm -hmm. you can 
you can go around, try on different things. Again, going back to like when you were a teenager, you might change your hairstyle every week. That doesn't mean you're not eventually going to just tire of that and, and, and choose something. Or you might continue changing your hairstyle every month for the rest of your life. That's, that's part of who you are. That it's your being, style. Yeah, right? being, yeah, changing is your style. Yeah, that's cool too. And if, if you were consistent, people might say, what happened to you? You're not you anymore exactly. because you're, I've seen you the same haircut many times over and again. Yeah. So interesting. Allow yourself to be who you are. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So, um, all right. So we are going to move to the section of the show, which we call what is your problem or what's your problem slightly less aggressively. Um, so what, what your, what's your problem is the, the section of the show where we, answer questions from the audience so i'm going to look for everybody who had a question that started with a q and see if it is um stuff we can ta we can t uh, tackle um all right so here's the first question that came from druid she, i'm not sure if it's a he or she or they it says is it okay to like detailing even the simple stuff can that be called a style detailing the simple stuff so i'm not sure quite what that means but what do you think it means and, and um i i think the question means that there's a right way to do things <laughs> and i i think if you feel like do you, i actually i used to think is it okay to put black lines around everything. Maybe that's what they're talking about. And then when I saw Matisse, I was like, yeah, of course it is. That was one of his his big breakthroughs. And the person I was doing art with was putting black lines. And I just I just like it's it's sort it was sort of um, let me control this a little bit more. And you look out there and there's that style everywhere. So yeah, but um, for me, it's, it likes the question is, is there a right or wrong? And, and there isn't. Do what you enjoy and what you like. You know, I just want to stick this George O'Keefe quote in here, and that is, she said, I, I've already settled it for myself. So praise and criticism go down the same drain, and I am quite free. So just imagine, you've already settled. I like this. I like this detailed. Whatever anybody says or criticize, it doesn't matter to me because I already like this. So I, I find that quite freeing myself. Too. What do you yeah. think? I think it's. I think a, a way of thinking about it is also saying, if I look at a piece of art that is very detailed, even the simple stuff is detailed. Um, what does that tell me about what this person, how this person sees the world? That does it tell me? I'm not going to debate whether that's a correct way to see the world or not, that's not my concern. It's, but are you expressing something about how you see the world? That's your style, right? So if you made the world all big shapes or all bright colors or um, you know, very abstract, whatever it is you're saying about the world is coming out in your work. And I think that that's, that's what we're looking for. That's what your art, that's the whole goal of art is to show us how do you feel about the world? So, um, Personally, yeah. just one more thing on that. I like really detailed work. I can't do it myself. Um, and I think that's important to know that I really like detailed work, but I can't do it. We can't always do the things that we like. So, that's true. so find the things that you can do. Um, SAA says, I like too many styles. I'm paralyzed from progressing with my practice. Have this weird fear of missing out somehow. So in other words, I like it all. I want to do lots of different things. Um, you know, I think that that's, again, that's like saying I go into the store and there's a million things I would like to buy. So buy one, try it on, come back next week, buy something else, try that on. There's no, you're not going to run out of things. You know, you're not going to run out of opportunities to try on stuff and to try on styles. Um, and, you know, absorbing a lot of them, you may find that while you like a lot of them, not necessarily all of them are really something that you can comfortably use in your own expression. So you might have lots of friends who are lots of who are all different. That's fine. But then you're you. So, you know, you might want to just kind of bring it in to trying things that maybe are things that you can do and that really feel comfortable and right on you, even though you continue to love all these other things. That would be my mm -hmm. thought. I, I would ask her because oftentimes people, when you ask them, 
what's the matter with you? Come up with what's the matter with them? And I, I would ask them, what has worked for you? Because I suspect there's been something that's worked for you. And to narrow it down to three, you know, having ADD, I like more than one. And, and narrow them down by writing them out on a list and auditioning them. Which one gives me the most energy? And start with that one, because that's bound that's to advice. lead you in the right direction. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Have a sample, taste it, see what it's, see what it's like, try it on. You don't necessarily have to pay for it and take it home. You can mm -hmm. just try it on in the store. Uh, Rumi says, my fear is that I don't draw academically accurate. How to overcome this fear and develop my own style without knowing how to draw properly. I don't know how to draw properly either. Do you, Jill? I don't know how to draw properly at all. I, I get a lot of people who have been through academics and they're trying to unlearn the unlearn. academics. Right. Yes. Exactly. So I think, I think don't think that's the goal, unless it is your goal. If it is your goal, then work really hard to draw academically. It's going to take a lot of work. You're going to have to take, do a lot of practicing. It may not express who you are. It may express an academic ideal, but maybe that's not you, you know, because if it was you, you'd want to do it and you put the work into doing it. But if it's not you, that's fine. There's that's no rule advice. that says that's what you have to do. Uh, the rule is you have to do you. That's the only rule. Do you, and that's not you. So don't do it. Do something else. But don't stop doing it because you haven't achieved this thing. So stop thinking about drawing properly. Drawing properly is drawing like Rumi Ayukawa. That's drawing properly for Rumi Ayukawa, and not for, for anybody else. So be yourself. Do you. So good. Well, you know what? There may be other questions, but I don't see cues in them. So we are kind of running out of time and uh, we may have to wrap it up. So thank you. Do you want to do the, the um, calisthenics? Yeah, we're pretty close on time. So um, yeah, let me pull up a couple more calisthenics just because they're fun. And uh, let's see if there's some other hairstyles that people came up with. Um, Alex says, like a kiwi. That's very evocative. Uh, not magic. Da Fox says random, messy, colorful. Again, more, a lot of messy people here. Uh, Kathy Lawler says brownish, grayish Bob. I used to know a guy who was brownish, grayish Bob. Um, so, <laughs> um, my leonine mane. Not sure where that came from. Um, so, oh, maybe that's JJ. It says my Leo nine mean she's Leo. Oh, yay, yes. Leo. Yes. Yay, JJ. So Niz says practically organized tangle. I like that too. So, all right. A lot of cool hairstyles out there. Thank you for sharing them. Um, I think we are wrapped up on style today. We'll come back with another topic next week. Thank you for joining us. And uh, Jill, any parting words about style or anything else you'd like to give? No, just just take some risks and, and have fun. And be yourself. Yeah. be yourself. Be yourself. That's yourself. the best style. Okay, this has been uh, Art for All, the Sketchbook School podcast. I'm Danny, and this is Jill, and we'll see you again next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.